You could have a tax question, and you could ask two CPAs the same question, and you could get a completely different answer from the two of them, and they could both be exactly right. right? They could both be correct. Now, the one answer might be better than the other, but there's many, many different ways of doing a lot of this stuff. And that's what, that's what makes it really challenging, because a lot of you guys, and myself included, have been to meetings like this where you hear something, you learn something, you're like, oh, I didn't know I can do that. You get all excited, and you go home, and the next day or the next week, you talk to your accountant, your CPA, and they're like, no, nah, you can't do that, or it doesn't work that way or something, and you're like, I don't know, uh, whatever. Um, it's, it's also important to understand that the, the industry that we're in, you know, if you're in the room and you own even a couple rental properties, but especially if you own 10, 20, 30 or more units, you're in the, like, there's not a lot of CPAs that will focus on that and make that a specialty. So, you know, it's no wonder that most of the CPAs in the county, in the state, whatever, don't understand this stuff. Uh, it's a very, very specialized thing, so there's not, a, there's not a need for all of them to really understand some of the stuff that John's going to be talking about uh, tonight. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to John. Uh, so please help me welcome John Lapp. There are three types of accountants. Those who can count and those who can't. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Jake was talking about slow learner. Uh, I was a slow learner. Uh, in school, I was a fourth in my class, uh, fourth, so I was right there. Uh, yeah, uh, just thinking about this meeting tonight and, you know, like, how did it come about that I'm up here this, tonight? And I was looking over just my life and what happened, and, and it was a lot of small, uh, like the compound effect. I had to think a lot about the compound effect, because it's nothing that happened overnight. Uh, I grew, grew up a great education, and uh, started a business in 2007, and I was doing accounting. I didn't know much about, I mean, I knew very little about accounting. And I was doing payroll. I had no idea why I'm holding federal, state, you know, uh, yeah, state unemployment, workers' comp, there was like local tax, seven different taxes. And uh, going down 322, I saw a note at H&R uh, Block, said you want to know more about taxes, and uh, I'm one of those people that I sign up, but I make sure it's far enough in the distance so I can push it off, you know, so I, but I signed up, and time came, to attend the class, and uh, classes were in a Bridgeport. I had 40 minute, 40 minute drive, but I was going to learn more about accounting for my business, for the business that I was uh, running with two of my brothers, and uh, I was, yeah, I think it was a, it was either an eight or twelve week course. I don't know what it was, but throughout the course towards the end of the course, and I don't know, I'm a slow learner or something because I didn't even know it was for employment. I had no idea. I was just going to learn more. And one of the last classes, one of the guys was like, are you going to get employed? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. And they said, well, if you pass over 80%, there's opportunity for employment. And uh, I passed over 80% and was in a seasonal business. So I said, yeah, why not? And so I went from October uh, this was in 08 then. October of 08, not knowing anything about taxes, to January, I was sitting at a table or at a desk, and I had people come in and I'm preparing their tax return. So, <laughs> talk about you know, getting out of the comfort zone, and that's what I've found is I get out of my comfort zone and that's where I grow, that's where things start to happen. So, uh, fast forward a couple of years, uh, 2010, I got my GED. Uh, yeah, so I was doing tax returns with no GED. Eighth grade education, no GED, and I wasn't just doing tax returns, but I was a uh, part of uh, a bank and I was giving out bank loans. So they, people would come in and do their taxes, 
we would give them a loan against their taxes. They would walk out with some of their money. And so I'm going, yeah, I'm basically working for, for a bank as well. So, uh, yeah, that was an interesting. So fast forward a couple of years, 2010, I got my GED. And uh, looking, I was looking at, you know, I, I was getting into the financial thing, and I was enjoying it. And uh, so I was looking into doing college in 2010, went all the way to 2017 before I enrolled in uh, Liberty University for uh, college. Uh, 2017, I enrolled, got, accept, got accepted, and never wrote an essay in my life. The most I did was, you know, I, going to school, I was a probably a C, maybe C minus student. And you know, this was 12, 15 years later. I enrolled in college, and my first class, I I did I did eight classes. I mean, not eight, four. I did four classes in my first my first semester. I didn't know what a semester was. I didn't know. Basically, I didn't know much of anything. And uh, uh, so I en enrolled in Liberty University the same day that I enrolled in Liberty University. I started biking, which I love biking now. I do a lot of cycling. And uh, there's a lot of uh, similarities between the two. That when the, when the time comes, when you think you're not going to you're not going to get up the hill, you know. Or you think you're not going to finish it a uh, lesson on time, you know, just keep pushing, keep going, keep doing, just take that next step, take that next pedal, and uh, and you know it's painful, but the best views are from the top, and so you just push through and get to the top, and uh, yeah, best views are from the top. So I uh, did. I enrolled in Liberty University in 2017. Uh, one of my first classes, I had to do. 2,000 word essays and a 1,200 word essay, I think. And I had a hard time writing a, you know, I had a hard time writing emails at that point. So it was, it was, a, it was a big deal. But what was interesting is I started doing college classes and I was actually good at it. After, you know, going to school, I was, like I said, number four in my class. But started doing college, I was actually good at it and. Yeah, I don't know what happened, but it just switched around. Either that or it was something I had an interest in, or I knew I needed to learn it to, you know, advance, my, uh, advance and, you know, to do other things I wanted to do. Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, I'm married. I have, uh, we've, Liz and I, we have four boys. Uh, ben, ben helps out in the office, uh, and then Alvin. Alvin has a lawn care business. Elijah, Elijah's 15, he, he helps out some with those businesses. And uh, Monica has that one. Uh, the information provided tonight does not and is not intended to uh, is not intended to constitute any tax or legal advice. Instead, all information content and material tonight is for general information purposes only. Information shared may not constitute the most up-to-date legal tax or their information. Uh, it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, and, and a lot of the taxes, a lot of what happens is if someone asks a question, the answer can oftentimes be it depends. It depends on your situation, depends on your circumstance. Every circumstance is different. And uh, we'll get into that a little bit tonight, why different circumstances have different uh, tax outcomes. Uh, it's just, it's, it's the beauty of the tax law. Yeah. Uh, tonight I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about uh, proper business techniques. I'm going to talk about what is a business. Uh, business accounting, and then uh, preparing for business audit. Uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit about new and sunsetting tax laws. That's going to be just, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. There's still a lot of uh, unanswered questions around that. Uh, and then uh, we're going to just go a little bit into the complexities of taxes. So, yay! <laughs> uh, and then uh, what can what can we do about the complexity of taxes? 
Uh, what is a business? Uh, how many how many of you in here own a business or uh, yeah, how many of you own a business by raise a hand? Uh, yeah, that's majority. And how many how many how many own uh, real estate in here? Okay, uh, yeah. yeah. Alright. Uh, so business IRS definition is any activity carried on for the production of income from selling goods or performing a service. Uh, so if your dog has puppies, is that a business? Yeah, yeah, that's business. And uh, so if you're taking, if you're reporting your dog income, now you should be looking at expenses. What kind of expenses can you get? What kind of expenses can you take to offset that income? Because you do not have to just record the income. You can also take the expenses. Uh, signing up for DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, any of those, that is a business. Uh, it was funny, my son, we, he has a lawn, we have a lawn care business, and uh, he was getting a little slow, so he signed up for DoorDash uh, to go out, and I'm like, he just started a business. He had no idea, he has no idea what the tax implications are going to be of starting that business, but he has a business now. He's going to get 1099, end of the year, and he's going to have to deal with it. So, uh, cleaning for someone that gives a 1099. That is, that is a, wow, well, that's questionable. But that's a considered business. I mean, on the tax return, yeah, that's a business on the tax, re on the tax return side. Uh, purchasing real estate is considered starting a business. Uh, so, yeah, as far as, a, as, as far as a business, it's very important to know what your income is on the business and then also what expenses can you take. Uh, is, there, is there improvements? Is there improvements around the property that you can take because you started this business? You know, is there, is there something, is, is there something that you can do? Is there a vehicle, that if you do DoorDash, you know, you can take your vehicle mileage and it's very important if you're taking mileage or if you're taking expenses, that you have documentation. That's what you're, you're going to hear me, hear me talk a lot about documentation tonight. That's probably one of the single most important things about taking an, taking an deduction is documentation. And yeah. Uh, business accounting. So now that we define that you have a business, which probably most of the people in here probably are involved in some kind of business. Uh, how do you account for business? Uh, set up a separate bank account. Uh, that, that's, that's, a little, that's touchy there, but if you have one little puppies, maybe you don't have to set up a se separate bank account. But if you want to start taking expenses, if you want to start taking uh, different depreciation and stuff, it's very important to, at some point, set up another bank account, run your business information through your business bank account. It's so simple to set up an account, and it keeps your personal and your business stuff separate. Uh, balance sheet. Uh, the balance sheet is the, the most important document of a business. And what the balance sheet does is it tells you, you can go down over the balance sheet. If the balance sheet is accurate, you can see all the assets. You can see the uh, liabilities and the equities of a company. Uh, the assets, assets will always be, the, be equal to the liabilities and the equity, and that's why they call it balance. So it always balances. If your uh, assets go up, either your liabilities are going to go up or your equity is going to go up every time. Uh, very, very important, uh, another thing is if you are running a business, you have a balance sheet, Make sure your loans are on the balance sheet. Make sure all your assets are on the balance sheet because then you can take that document and you can see the health of your business through that, uh, through that balance sheet. Uh, right here's a note. When the balance sheet is correct, usually the rest of the accounting is also correct. Uh, that is if you have separate credit cards or if you have uh, a separate bank account. If you have a separate bank account and separate credit cards, at the end of the year, 
you uh, zero the balances out, you make sure that your checking account is just a uh, generic, it's just a generic balance sheet here, but you make sure your checking account matches your checking account. You make sure the uh, credit card liabilities match your credit card statement. And there's no way, I mean, there's some stuff that could be categorized wrong, but the business expenses and everything should be in the business, should be recorded in the business if, if you did that way. Uh, so right here you have the uh, total assets and then total liabilities and equity. Uh, it'll, it'll always, balance sheet will always balance, unless there's something, unless it does. So. Uh, profit and loss is the second most important uh, document for a business. Uh, tells you how profitable your business is. Uh, profit and loss consists of the income, expenses, and then <coughs> bottom line profit. Uh, here's an example. You, know, you just have the income up here, cost of the goods, and then here's your gross profit, selling expenses, and then right here's your net profit. Uh, disregard the bottom part here because that is a corporation that pays taxes and stuff out of there. So this, for the most part, this is what would be on the uh, profit and loss of a business. Uh, business expenses. I uh, listen to Tom Wilwright a lot, and uh, one of the things he says, this is from his, some of the, some of the stuff I'm going to be saying tonight is coming directly from some of his quotes, and uh, so i got to give him a little bit of credit here. But business expenses, what is a business expense? Uh, there's, four, there's, there's four things to look for to make sure it's a business expense. Uh, it's, is it ordinary? Is, is, the, is the expense ordinary within your business? Uh, there was a uh, real estate agent in California that bought a yacht, wrote the yacht off uh, as a business expense. And uh, IRS, audited, IRS audited her, and uh, she said she sells high dollar real estate on the uh, bay, or yeah, uh, whatever it is, the bay or the, along the water anyway. It takes her clients out there, and uh, yeah, she, she got away with it. It was legit. Uh, can any farmer just buy a yacht? No, because that's not ordinary in your business. So that's, that's, where, some of the, that's where some of the differences come in. Well, I can, I can take this deduction. Well, can Jason take the same deduction? Maybe not, you know, because we have two different businesses. Uh, is it ordinary in my business to, you know, to travel for, I don't know what, yeah, just you know, different travel expenses. Some that's ordinary in my business might not necessarily be nor, uh, ordinary in someone else's business. Uh, is it necessary? Uh, is it necessary to do that to uh, to uh, keep your business running? Uh, and then, is it for business purpose? So, yeah, business, business, and then document. Documented. Of these four, the documentation is going to get you, get you farther than any of the others are. It might not be ordinary, but if you have it documented, you might get away with it. It might not be necessary, but if you have it documented, you might get away with it. Tom Wilwright says he sees people get away with stuff that maybe is borderline, but they have the documentation to back it, and they get away with it. So it's documentation is very important and with the next season that we're going to be coming into with uh, IRS auditors they're going to be trained two weeks something like that and they're going to come out and do audits what are they going to know they're they're not going to know much of anything so what are they going to they're going to have a checklist we'll get to that later but <laughs> yeah uh, documentation uh, what is taxable all income is taxable the IRS says all income is taxable unless we say it isn't. And no expenses are, du are deductible unless we say they are. <laughs> right, right on, yeah. Uh, and then there's the U.S. tax code is 6,871 pages. The majority of the pages explain what income does not need to be recorded and what expenses are deductible. And so somewhere in there, in those 6,000 pages, 
if you can find that your business or that your behavior matches what the IRS is looking for, for behavior, then you can take the deduction. If it doesn't, then you can't take the deduction. Uh, the IRS, the government is geared towards creating jobs. Uh, businesses are a good incentives. Uh, government loves businesses because you create jobs. Uh, the, 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 the private sector is a lot better at creating jobs than the government is. And so they incentivize the private sector to go out and create jobs. And that's why you get the deductions. And uh, I don't think we need to be afraid to take any legit expenses. We just need to have it documented. And we need to uh, plead our case. This is why we can have it. This is why this is, this is according to the way I read it. We can have this deduction. This is why. And uh, there's not like we need to be afraid of anybody. We don't need to be afraid of being audited. We just need to to uh, be able to prove to, be, uh, to prove that we can take those. Uh, U.S. tax code is a moving target. So what you can take this year, you might not be able to take next year. It keeps everything exciting, right? So so how do we know? <laughs> it's just it's just a constant. It's just a constant update. It's a constant. Trying to figure out, you know, what you can take this year, what what uh, what things are coming are new, and uh, what things are uh, going by the wayside. Uh, preparing for a business audit. I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a little time on business audits, just because of I feel like there's a lot of money being left on the table with audits. I feel like a lot of businesses are paying more than they need to because of improper documentation. And uh, and I'm going I'm I'm going for for this purpose I'm just going to be talking about uh, unemployment, the Pennsylvania unemployment compensation and uh, workers' comp because workers' comp needs to be filled out every year for anybody that has W two employees and what will happen is the auditor will come back and ask about your 1099 uh, contractors and if you can't explain to them that they're that they are, in fact, 1099 contractors, they will try to uh, reclassify them as employees. And then what happens is that if they reclassify them as employees, now you're liable to, to pay workers' comp on your contractors. I had a friend before, a couple years ago, came to me and uh, he had, uh, He had he got he got his workers comp audit back and he owed eighteen thousand on his workers comp audit and uh, he, he contacted me he's like what should I do what like they won't they, they were at their max at their wits end and uh, didn't know what to do anymore so what am I supposed to do and uh, so I told him give me the contacts for the auditor uh, talk with the auditor said what do you guys need. And they said, well, he doesn't have documentation to prove that this is that these guys aren't employees. And then, what documentation do you need? That the documents that they provided, the contract didn't have the proper information in the contract. And so I said, well, can we get you other contract? Can we get you an updated contract? Yeah. Okay. So I went out and I got, I think it was six or seven contractors. We went out, filled out a, uh, an updated contractor agreement, and sent it in. I mean, it took, I don't know, a couple of weeks, but we got the audit from 18 down to like two, somewhere in the $2,000 range. Uh, so that's just with documentation. He was ready to write a check just to get this, just, to, just because he didn't want to deal with it anymore. And uh, with documentation, we were able to you know, get that down. And it was, it was a it was a smooth process. It was just working with the auditor. The auditor wasn't nasty or anything. It was just they weren't getting the information they needed. They weren't getting the documents they needed. Once we provided them with documents so that we could prove that this is what they are, then it was it was yeah it was just a smooth. They they agreed with us. So uh, and yeah. Uh, IRS audits will revolve around proper documentation. That's, that's what they're going to be looking for. Uh, credit card statement is not a sufficient document. 
that a credit card statement is not a uh, document that they can go back on. They actually need the physical receipt. Uh, electronic documentation is the way to go. Take a picture of the receipt and throw it away. Don't mess with it. Don't bring it back in the office. You know, just find an app, find some software that connects with QuickBooks or that does something. Take that picture and get rid of them. I'm, I hate papers. <laughs> Uh, I probably have as, little, have as little paper in my office as about anybody does. So I just, you know, if someone wants something, I'm like, send me a PDF, send me a, send me a document that's you know, not, not a paper document. Uh, 1099 contractors. Uh, if there's anybody in here still paying their contractors' employees with a 1099, make sure you do the proper, take the proper steps. Uh, this is this is probably the most audited in the Pennsylvania area. And what happens is uh, they will say, no, these are, well, just, just make sure you're not saying too much or over communicating, but that you have the documentation that you need to actually prove that they're contractors. And uh, what you need is the contractor needs to submit a bill. It doesn't, I, I put here irregular bills are better, but it doesn't have to, they can send a bill every Friday. Uh, they need to be able to, uh, like if, if, if there's a law, they need to be able to take a loss. They can't just make money on every one. You know, if, if there's a certain dollar, dollar amount that you set for a project and they could actually have a loss on that, that's what a contractor is. If they, if they will make money on every project every time, you know, they will probably get reclassified as an employee. Uh, have a contractor have, have a contractor agreement in place. Uh, just a, a contractor agreement that says uh, that they that they need to provide their own tools and that they are free to make their own time. There's a couple of things that the Pennsylvania looks for. Those are a couple of those things that they look for need to be in that contract. Uh, different different organizations are different. Some auditors don't really really need the contractor agreements. Others will automatically, you know, if they don't agree with what the agreement says, automatically throw it over and say, no, it's, a, it's an employee. So, very different. Or, uh, from one auditing company to the other, they're very different. But they're not, we don't have to be afraid of them. Uh, we had one audit just within the last two months or something, and they wanted a pile of information. They wanted the three month bank statements, they wanted all the transactions that happened, and that was from 2019. But we were able to, to provide them with everything that they needed, and they came back, sent a letter, said there was no adjustments. You know, so that's, yeah, that's a good, that's always, it's always good to see that. But we had the proper documentation, we were able to give them everything that they needed. Uh, get contractors to fill out a W-9, Give them a 1099 at the end of the year. Uh, contractor need their own li uh, liability insurance. Uh, one of the things with these is there's certain things to say and there's certain things not to say to an auditor. Because once you say something, you can't take it back. But never refer to them as employees because they are not employees, they're contractors. So like, the word employee is not a part of that conversation. If they ask, if, if you provide the tools, you can come back and say they bring their own tools. You don't have to answer that question. You just say they bring their own tools. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good enough. Uh, one, one, one mistake is they get too much information. Uh, one of the things we say is give them what they need, but don't give them anything else. If they need more, let them ask for more, rather than giving them more than they need. Uh, audit do's and don'ts. Uh, do always make sure it's legit. Uh, initial IS contact will always be via mail. Do not call for emails and phone scams. And that actually goes to warning IRS auditors. If you ever get an email that says you need to do something immediately, or someone's going to get hurt, or something's going bad's going to happen, you know, don't jump for it. And, and if it says you can't contact your friend or tell anybody else. Tell your friends and family about it. <laughs> it's, I, I see it happen too often where people are losing money 
because the scammers scare them. And it's not like, don't be afraid. Just just go in and, you know, it's the, the phone scammers and, and other scammers, they're trying to, to, to uh, manipulate you through your fear. And so they're trying to get you to fear. And if they can get you to fear, then they, then they, have, a, then they have a grip on you. So always just pick up the phone and talk to someone. You're, they're not going to come and take you to jail if you tell them, if you, if you, if you tell someone else. Uh, always respond. Uh, here's one thing that I see that happens some is, is uh, we hope that the situation will just take care of itself. And so we don't deal with it. And, you know, just put, it, put the letter somewhere. Ah, this, this isn't going to, like, it's not a big deal. I'm just going to put it somewhere where I don't have to deal with it. Well, guess what? 30 days later, you get another letter. You get another letter. And if, if you can be more proactive, get them the information as soon as you can, let them know you're on top of it, and you want to get this thing resolved as soon as possible. Uh, the auditors will work with you a lot more. Uh, one of the things to think about when you think about an auditor is some of these people are locked in a dark room with a six by six cubicle, and uh, they have very little control over what happens in their own life and almost no control of the audit. And so all you need to do is convince that person that you can take that deduction. And if, if you ever get into a little more in-depth of an audit, They'll be like, oh, I need to talk with my manager. Oh, I need to talk with my manager. I need to talk with my manager. So you're, 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 they, they have it tiered to where if you go and you're chewing this person out or right, tell them, give them a piece of your mind, uh, you're, you're, you're probably talking to someone that has zero control over this whole thing. And uh, you probably won't get in contact with anybody that has any control or that can make this problem go away. So it's just, it's... It's a part, it's, it's just how it is, so as much as we don't like it. Uh, contact your accountant. Always, always contact your accountant uh, if, there's, if there's an audit. Uh, do not give access to your accounting software. Never, ever give access to accounting software to an auditor. They, they cannot request, they cannot, they can ask for it, but they can't demand you to give, to give it to them. Uh, and another thing is, do not give more information than what is needed. Uh, I was at, uh, at a meeting with Tom Wilwright, and he said uh, there was an audit done. The uh, client contacted the accountant. The accountant said, I need this information. The client sent the information to the accountant, a whole file of information. And, the client, and an accountant went and forwarded that to the auditor. And it was a low-level audit, and it ended up being a full-blown audit. And three and a half years later, they're just coming out of it. That's how, because, and, it, and it's all because they got too much information. So never, ever give more information than they need. And never talk with an IRS auditor. The, the accountants are here to talk to the auditors. And, uh, and you know, we know more of what to say and what not to say. And you know, we, we, we don't give more information than what is needed to, to resolve the case. The, the, the case. Uh, uh, tax notes. If I make more money, all of my income will be taxed at a higher bracket. That is not true. The US tax is a progressive tax. And so your first amount of income will always be taxed at 10%. Second bracket will always be 12. Third, 22, 24, 32. It doesn't matter if you jump to the next tax bracket, it does not put all of your income into that bracket. It just does the money that's over the amount that's for the next bracket. The more money I make, the more taxes you will pay. That's a myth as well. There's ways to legally reduce your taxes. Uh, but here's a, here's a catch up. Never invest or buy something solely to save on taxes. There's people that would spend $2 to save a dollar. You know, don't do that. Because 
the, the ultimate goal isn't just to stay out of tax, it's also to make wise financial decisions uh, for your for whatever is best of your interest. Uh, make sure if you buy something to save taxes that you that you will actually save on taxes. There's people that make investments. Oh my friend said, my friend said if I buy this, I'm gonna save fifty thousand in taxes. Well, you have a different tax situation than your friend has. Or you have a different accountant than your friend has. Or, yeah. One of, one of the things I see occasionally is someone will say, oh, I'm getting this tax deduction. I look at their tax return, I'm like, no, you're not. So they, you know, they, they think they are, but they actually aren't because you know, they don't know how to read their tax return. So, you know, yeah. It's, it's also important to learn, you know, what the numbers mean on the tax return and uh, and what deductions you are actually getting. Uh, make sure you're doing everything ethical. Uh, we're we're here. Like like for me, I have a, an ethical standard that I need to follow. And uh, I was just in a, a two-hour ethics. Uh, conference this afternoon, or not conference, it was online, they were talking about ethics, and the one, wasn't it, uh, a CPA was talking, CPA and another guy were talking, another guy said uh, he was doing this family tax return for a long time, and they were always getting a big amount of child tax credits, always a huge child tax credit uh, refund, and it was about one fourth of their income was from child tax credits, so they were making around Probably fifty thousand and got six, seven, whatever. I, I can't do the math right now. But but uh, about one fourth of their income was from a child tax credit. One day he, this guy drove into the uh, accountant's office with a I don't know what kind of vehicle it was, but it was a hundred thousand dollar vehicle. And accountant's like, oh, that's going to take you a little time to pay that thing off. And they're like, oh no, he cashed it out. And so he's saying, okay, did you get like an inheritance or what happened? What happened is he was fixing cars on the side in the evenings and he wasn't reporting his income. And so this accountant was like, well, I know this now, so I'm going to have to report it. He's like, oh, no, you're not. And uh, so then it becomes an ethical issue where, you know, there's, there's legal ways to do it. And I would just say stay out of the... You know the muddy waters, and just keep it keep it legal and ethical. Uh, but he ended up having to, you know, uh, what would just release the, the uh, that that couple, and that couple had a lot of their friends in his accounting firm as well, and so his whole accounting firm went through a big uh, like an exit. A lot of people left because of this incident. But he was like, what was I supposed to do? Because I have an ethical standard that I need to hold up. So, uh, statute of limitation. This is uh, it's very exciting how the IRS tells you how long to keep documents. Who knows how long we need to keep documents? Three years? Seven years? Seven? Depends. Yeah, it's three years. It's six years if the tax if the tax burden emits of an amount that is 25% or more of the amount reported. And the IRS generally has 10 years from the date of assessment to collect the timely assessed tax liability. And there's no statute of limitation if fraud is committed. So if there's fraud committed, they can go back 50 years. So that's the kind of stuff, you know, it's really nice if they make stuff like clear like this, isn't it? Uh, and then a tax here, yeah. A taxpayer should keep each document, each supporting document, for as long as it may be needed for the administration of any provision of the tax code. How long is that? Yeah. <laughs> so that's yeah. And, and we're just taking information. I'm just taking information from the IRS. And so if someone asks you how long, I mean, if you ask your accountant how long should I keep my tax returns, well, it's yeah. I don't know. Maybe 10 years? Uh, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the new Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, the IRS budget is basically doubled. So they have, they're deploying, Joe, 
How many, how many agents are they deploying? 80,000 80, agents, and they have an $80 billion budget or something? Yeah. So they are almost doubling their staff. And from what I hear, they're not going to be putting the people on phone, you know, answering phone calls and stuff. So they're going to be putting them in, out in the field, which I don't know. I think they should do some more phone, have a better phone system, which they might update some of that stuff. Uh, they're, they're working, the IRS is working with software from back in the 80s. And uh, so there's like some of the, some of the uh, I think they're working with five different systems right now. And so that, that's also what can create some of the complexities and stuff. Uh, if your accountant is afraid of the IRS, it's time to get a new accountant. Because the, the IRS, they're, they're not to be afraid of, but uh, we need to be ethical and we need to you know, make sure we have documentation and stuff. Uh, here again, documentation. The new IRS audits will have checklists. They're going to come out and they're going to have a couple of things that need you to check off of their list. If they can check them off the list, you're good to go. If you can't check them off the list, they'll probably hand it to their uh, supervisor uh, or if they'll try to get that information. Uh, audits will start kicking up around 2025 uh, with, the, with the new information, with the new agents coming out, uh, we're, bound to see, we're bound to see more audits. Uh, and I'm just, just, just curious, but like, is there anybody in the, in the room here that either had an IRS field audit or an office audit in the lab? There you go. Any, anybody else? Two? I, I, would, I would dare to say in five years, there's going to be a lot more hands going up. Uh, so I would just say don't be afraid, but just you know, make sure you have your documentation and stuff. Uh, government still loves incentives. Electric cars and vehicles. Electric cars and trucks. Uh, there's some of this stuff I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna go into it a lot because there's there's moving moving targets here and we don't know exactly how it's gonna flush out. I know with the cars and trucks uh, <coughs> one of one of what was said was it that uh, a certain percent of the materials need to be manufactured in the United States to get the credit. Uh, I don't know how we're, how we're going to figure that out, but we'll figure it out. Uh, all property owners should at least look into solar. A uh, large project need to watch, watch the prevailing wage rules, but the solar credits are going to be really good in the next uh, 20 years, I mean 10 years, up until uh, 2032. Uh, so that's one thing. If you're a business, it's even better. So right now you get a 30% deduction or a 30% tax credit if you install solar. If you're a business, you can then take depreciation out off of 85% of what's remaining, or of 85% of the uh, total price of installing the system. So you can actually get depreciation for some of the money that, for some of the same money that you had credits on. So that's and yeah, if we get, if we get time, I'll, I'll uh, go through those. I'll go through some of those figures, which are uh, pretty cool. Uh, research and development credits. There are still research and development credits out there. Uh, there again, I don't have a lot of details on what those are. I just know that there's R&D credits out there as well. Uh, energy efficient home improvement credit, energy store. Uh, did any of you guys take that credit in the last? Uh, since 2006 that you know of. Yeah, a couple. The, the credits were uh, products that qualify with the old tax code. It was a $500 total lifetime limit. And it was, like the different items had different dollar amounts that they were, that they would, uh, that they would give a tax credit on. And so, you know, $300 for an air source heat, there's Natural gas per paying furnace, 150 bucks. Uh, so it was. It wasn't like a really enticing, you know, home energy credit uh, tax credit. But with the with the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, this is now the here are products that qualify. The new tax code 
is up to $1,200 yearly. And this is a tax credit. This is not a tax deduction. But you can actually reduce your taxes by $1,200 yearly from home, uh, from, from home improvement credits if they have the energy store, store on there. And this is yearly. So if you want to do something, and I don't know what percent it is. I'm sorry, somebody here might know. Does anybody know what percent uh, the credit is? I'm thinking it's 30, but I'm not sure of the uh, amount, but up to 1,200. And there again, we don't have any numbers on if it's limited to any of these. You know, if, if it's a dollar amount limit per line item. But it could be something where eventually you could do improvements like every year and do, you know, maximize that credit every year for the next 10 years and actually do home. Some setting tax codes. A couple of that are going to affect some of, the, uh, some of the people here in the room. Uh, 2023 bonus depreciation is going to be 80%. Unless they uh, update or come or uh, get something else passed before 2023, but your 100% bonus depreciation will go back to 80% 2024, 60, and then it'll fade down. Some people say it'll fade back to 50% on new. I think it was new 50% uh, on new product, uh, but I don't think used products qualified for this one before 2017, and then. Mules will go back to 50% in 2023. I know there's more, but these are the two that I uh, have on here. Uh, if there's any. The bonus depreciation right now is on anything purchased. Right now, you can 100% depreciate anything that you purchased in the year that you purchased it. Right? In 2023, you're only going to be able to take 80% bonus depreciation. Uh, tax complexities. Here's where it gets fun. You guys, you guys still wait? You guys still, like, yeah, yeah, good, good. Uh, rental property versus a flipping property. How, how, how does a rental property get taxed? How does a flipping property get taxed? Uh, can I have any? Long term, short term. Long term, short term? Schedule C or Schedule E. Schedule C or Schedule E, yeah. Passive or active? Well, I guess, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the the uh, rental property could be could be passive, could be active, but the flipping is probably always active. Well, unless you would invest and someone else would be running it, then it could be passive if you don't get your hours in. So either one could be passive, either one could be active, right? I'm a private property, active or passive. <laughs> right, right, yeah. Uh, real estate professional. I think Joe wanted to touch a little bit about real estate professional, what a real estate professional is. Uh, real estate professional is, it, this is where it gets into the passive and the active loss limitation rules and the, and the uh, yeah. This is, this is where it gets complex to try to explain, you know, in a room if someone's a real estate professional or not. Uh, basic rules are you need to be Actively involved, more than half of your labor needs to come from a real estate, a real estate uh, related, real estate related activity. Uh, and then the question becomes, what is real estate related? And according to the uh, 2021 passive loss rules, construction and construction workers are in a real estate related activity. And so any construction in essence is a real estate professional. But then they need to, if they want to take their real estate, their rental real estate as active, they need to have more than 500 hours in their rental side of it uh, per year to become, to actually be a real estate professional. Is there, can I have more feedback on? That's all it takes? Okay. <laughs> all right. Uh, cost segregation. What's cost segregation? Uh, who knows what cost, segrega cost segregation is? You can actually do a cost segregation study in the second year, or you can do a cost segregation from properties that you bought five years ago or ten years ago. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind, as the uh, accelerated depreciation goes down, uh, goes down to 80%, 60%, 40%. If you bought a property four years ago, 
you can still accelerate it and take anything five years in that year. So you can actually do some of that. You can you can file 3115, which is a which is a form that you're saying you want to now start properly depreciating this building, which you were doing it improperly before. And uh, you can do it with one property at a time. You do not have to do it across your whole portfolio. You can say, I want to do this property this year, two years later. You can say, I want to do this property. And you can, you can do that even after, even after bonus depreciation isn't even, isn't a part anymore. And you can pick and choose which properties you want to do that with. Uh, so right here is an image of, uh, of the cost segregation. So right here you have a big bucket. This is your property. It's a 39 year or a 39 year if it's commercial, 27 and a half year if it's residential. And you can put some of that into five or seven year. Uh, you can put some of that into a 15 year, uh, and some of it into 15 year land improvement. You cannot depreciate the actual land. But what you're doing is you're splitting out these, uh, you're splitting out and taking this down. So you can do about five to seven year, you can do about 10, uh, 20%. And in these two buckets, you can do about 10%. So you can reduce this amount by 30 and then take faster depreciation on these items right now. Right here, and then with bonus depreciation, you can anything that's under 20 year property can be depreciated one year. So if this is 30 percent of the bill of the purchase price, you can take that whole 30 percent depreciate it in the first year that you bought it. So so here here's more of the complexities of the tax code. So what's the difference between I mean how do we get our tax code? Here's our here's how accountants think. Most accountants think in straight lines. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four. Uh, and there's how an attorney thinks. <laughs> and most of our tax code is made by. I mean, is the, the, the attorneys come up with the tax code, and it's done through lobbying. So, how can these people that are doing the actual returns figure out what's going on? And I started going down here this. After I had this down, I, I realized both of them stopped like right there. There was no, I didn't even realize it when I got the image. So. <laughs> but it's, it's perfect, right? Like, like, here we go. Okay, we're going to have a good day. Oh, you know, no, we can't go that way. Well, we can't go that way. We come down here, can't go that way either. So, so what do we do? <laughs> that's, that's how some of the days feel. So. And that's why you get different answers from your friends or, you know, different accountants because because of that. Uh, real life example. Business income, 150000 Purchases a rental property of 500000 no. and has rental income of 300000 How hard can that tax return be? Uh, so right here we have the tax return. I don't know if you guys can see it there in the back. Uh, business income, 150000 Rental income, 30000 And then the first one here was a 27 and a half year depreciation, no bonus depreciation. Depreciation was 12,728. Total income 16,272. Adjustments. Uh, the adjustment is basically the half of the Social Security tax or the self employment tax. And uh, get standard deduction, QBI. Taxable income 115. This person owes $44,887 in taxes. So, perfect. Example two, he took a bonus depreciation, did this one over 15 years, did this one over five years, just like they should. Uh, reduce the taxes a little bit, but not a lot because uh, for these, it's uh, like this one here would be 15, would be divided over 15 years in the first year, you only get half because of the depreciation. Uh, example three, now we're at a full bonus depreciation. Same income, depreciation for 27 and a half years. We have the uh, full 50, we have the full 100. Accelerated depreciation, uh, total income 21,287. And then we still have the adjustments. Uh, can't, get it, can't get away from the, from the uh, self employment tax uh, on the 150,000 here. So, self employment tax, we still got half. Uh, where we at here? Adjustments to income, we still get half of that in back or taken out of income. Uh, taxable income is zero. 
uh, still 21,000. Uh, anybody that's Social Security and Medicaid exempt, Medicare exempt, this would be zero at this point. Uh, so, and, and your taxes due would be these amounts because right here we have self-employment tax. Uh, self-employment tax is Social Security and Medicare. Uh, example four, so now we put this guy and uh, we gave him, we, we uh, created an S Corp and uh, paid him out of an S Corp and did his 90000 as draws rather than as uh, business income and took the full depreciation, came down, taxable income was 21287 standard deduction 12550 12, and then total taxable income, he owed 873 yeah, but the only difference is 42,000 counting. <laughs> right, <laughs> right. Uh, and then example six, because one of the things right in here, uh, we had a total income of 21,287. Uh, one of the problems that, that happens is the banks don't like to see that. If you want to keep investing in real estate, you almost have to educate the bankers why you only have a $21,000 income. Uh, so here would be, this example is now not taking the 15-year uh, on the, I mean, not taking the bonus on the 15-year, still taking the full bonus on the five-year, which I would actually rather do the other way around, because the 15-year, what's, what's that appreciation going to be worth in 15 years? But we have an income, total income of 69,000, 70,000. We have uh, total taxes due of $8,000, $8, which... I, I don't think it's horrible. Uh, this one here is, you know, better. But you know, I'm, I'm, what, whatever the uh, client wants. You know, we can. So out of these five tax returns, uh, these two right here would be contingent on this business being an LLC. That business would have to be an LLC so that we could choose to file this way on on example four and five. But other than that. These four tax returns are done correctly. Uh, now, I didn't have any QBI in here, which I didn't, it's not done like, totally total correctly at this point, but, but these four are done correctly. This one here is the one that's done incorrectly. Uh, but the IRS, the IRS will accept this one because it's more, because you owe more. So, so this one's acceptable, the other four are correct. So, so what's, like, yeah, so this is one of the reasons why you get different answers with the exact same. This, and this was as simple as 150000 business income, 30000 rental income, bought a property. Three transactions, or three things that happened. Now, now, you know, put more business to, you know, how complex can it get once you start adding that stuff into this tax return? So. Uh, Summary, make sure all business income and expenses are properly recorded. And make sure you're taking those expenses. If you're recording income, look for expenses to offset some of that income. Uh, if you're doing a 1099 and you're paying self-employment uh, self tax, you know, there's a good, the self-employment tax is 15.3% 15, 15 and there's no way to get out around that. The first, I mean, if you get a 1099, 600 bucks, it's going to be it's going to be on that first 600 bucks, and so and there's it's really hard to offset that, you know, with with uh, taking your income down or, or there's almost no way to offset that social security tax, except filing a, a filing as an S corp. Uh, Got to say it again, documentation, documentation, documentation. Uh, you can expect audits audit to increase over the next few years, and. Uh, when we keep documented records, we do not need to be afraid of an audit. Uh, and then the last, and certainly not the least, but continue to get educated. Read books, even if, like Jake said earlier, even if it seems sometimes like you're knocking your head up against the wall, keep reading, keep learning, and uh, at some point you'll start, you'll, you'll start getting more than what you knew a year ago or five years ago. And, uh, uh, one of the things I wanted to touch yet is 1099-Ks. Who knows what a 1099-K is? Anyone? No. Okay. 
1099 K's are going to, there's more people going to be seeing 1099 K's, and they are, at this point, if, it, if nothing changes, Venmo, eBay, Cash App, and uh, all these different organizations need to send out a 1099 K to anyone that sold over $600 worth of stuff. And it's, it's going to be, it, probably every accountant is probably going to handle differently. But if you sold a bike for 100 bucks and you paid $200 for it, did you have a gain? No. Do you need to pay taxes on that? No. But you're still going to get the form. So how is that form going to be dealt with when it comes out? Uh, it's going to have to be on the tax return somewhere to record that income. Uh, but there's, but I don't, I don't know. That's that's something that we haven't got. We're we're not clear on how we're going to record it, but we know that we're going to record it, and it's not going to be income if you didn't sell, sell anything at a gain. Uh, so it's, there's there's going to be 1099 Ks coming out to people, and they're going to be like, "What in the world is this?" And uh, what happens is income like. If you sell, a, if you buy a bike for three hundred dollars, you sell it for five hundred dollars. You're supposed, you're supposed to record that two hundred dollars as a gain. But if you buy a bike for three hundred and you sell it for a hundred, you're not allowed to take that two hundred dollars as a loss. And so, that's where these ten ninety nine Ks are going to come in because they're they're saying, hey, you're doing you're doing transactions. Uh, up until this year, the limit was twenty thousand. The limit has come way down to six hundred dollars. In uh, I think it's 2022. I'm not sure. 2022 or 2023. So that's one of, one of the things that you're going to be seeing. Uh, with that, thank you very much. All right, I have three questions. Um, this year we redid one of the kitchens in our apartment, and I was wondering if I can do a the 100% depreciation on that on everything I put in the kitchen: sink, refrigerator, stove. Cabinets, all those type of things. Okay. Uh, question on the apartment: Is it rented or is it personal? It's rented. Uh, it, yes, you can do you can do full depreciation. Okay, but <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> is it? Are you a real estate <clears throat> professional or no. do you do you work W two income? W two. Is this apartment? Is it a short term rental or is it long term rental? Long term. Okay. So there's loss limitation rules that are going to come in place with that. Uh, because you're not a real estate professional, uh, you're only, if you make 100000 or less, you can deduct up to 25000 off of your uh, W-2 income. But if you make between $100,000 and $150,000, it will be phased out $1,000 for every 2000 extra dollars you make. So if you make one ten, you could do 20000 you could deduct 20000 up until the 150th is fully phased out. So, there's okay. a phase out, so, see? Well, yeah. That's not gonna work. Okay, <laughs> um, credit cards. I have a Lowe's card, which I only use for business, and I only use it for repairs. Now, do I still have to take pictures of the receipts for each one of that, or can I still go online and just kinda print them out if I need them? If you have Lowe's, or if you have a company that stores your receipts online, you do not need to keep those receipts. Okay. Anywhere else. All right. Excellent. It's, 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 it's just a matter of do we have access to them? Can we prove it? Yeah. And that's all, right. all we need. Thanks, John. Yep. So, uh, my wife's a realtor, and so I use her to buy properties or sell something. So, anyway, recently we went on an anniversary trip in the DR for a week. And during that time, we uh, spent a couple hours at a coffee shop looking at properties, scheduling, um, scheduling like showings, all that type of stuff. Now, since we did some business during that time, can I write the whole trip off as an expense? Okay. <laughs> okay, good question, yeah. Uh, so, did you go to DR for a business reason? Not necessarily. Did you, do, did you look at properties? Did you have interest in properties? Or did you do anything? In the area, that's area specific. No, we did not. Then the answer is no. <laughs> okay. <All right. laughs> and and that's, what, that's what you need to do is you need to you need to start thinking 
if I'm going here, how can I make this a business expense? And to make it a business expense, you need to have over half of your time needs to be needs to be spent in the area specific. It's not just a coffee shop, but it's in the area. If you're looking at real estate or something in the area uh, for four hours a day, uh, Monday to Friday, you don't have to do it weekends. So you can go Fridays and you can spend four hours on a Friday, and then you can spend four hours on a Monday, four hours on a Tuesday. You can do, you know, if there's a conference specific, you can do that. But yeah. There's okay, so like I noticed there's a lot of properties for sale. Like, so we would have just gone and looked at properties with no intention of buying. Would that count? Uh, or is that just shady business? Would that would that have been a, a real estate like with no intention to buying? No, not if, not if there's no intention to buy anything. Okay, thanks for answering the question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, did I say this is for entertainment purposes only? <laughs> this, is not legal, this is not legal advice. Um, so I have a question on the $2,500 safe harbor um, uh, exemption. For Is that for real estate professionals only, or can a W-2 employee uh, use that to opt out? Um, so basically, the, the you can elect to deduct any expenses up to $2,500 and the IRS won't, won't audit you or won't, and they won't come back and say, okay, show me the... Um, you're, you're saying on property improvements? Yes. Okay. And then your question from there was, if anyone can take that, that would, that would come in with loss limitation rules again. Okay. So if, you're, if your uh, income is under 100000 you could take up to 25000 of passive losses, right then off. But if it's, it will phase out between 100 and 150,000. And that's the same for a single taxpayer and for a ma married taxpayer. Okay. Those are the same either way. And then is that uh, fixture, is that a permanent part of the tax code or did that recently get slipped in there? Or why didn't we hear much about that? Until the 2,500 yeah. deduction? Yeah. It's, it's called a safe harbor. Yeah, minimum or whatever. But, but otherwise, you would still take it as a bonus depreciation, right? Right, but it, it means that now, if with proper documentation, if I replace you know um, my kitchen and I keep my cabinets separate and I keep my granite countertops separate and I keep my faucets separate and they're all under twenty five hundred dollars, I can write them off the first year. As, a, as, a, as an expense. And, and you're saying as, as a, this would be as an improvement yes. to a rental property? Yes. If, if, if it's not more than $2,500, for instance, I, per, I don't have to depreciate it. Yeah, because I would, I would think it was per property, $2,500 per property per year. Yeah, well, you might want to read the tax code because what my tax account did with the $2,500. Um, safe Harbor minimums was just absolutely cool. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So we're going to be using that some more if it stays around. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, John. Hey, how's uh, it going? Thanks. <laughs> thanks for all the information tonight. It was pretty great. Yeah. Uh, question on auditing. Um, can they come in and audit a company that has been shut down for, say, Five, seven, eight years. For what? Like uh, federal, state? Uh, probably not. I mean, that that would just be like off the top. I would say probably not. Okay. But you know, yeah. like there's no rule. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Right. Sure, I understand that. But that that would be my initial my initial response would be probably not because I think it would be over three years. Now if there would be fraud that happened. You know, there might be a different there might be a different reason because now they can come back and open it back up again. So, yeah. Thank you. Yep. So, should you always do cost save, or is it price specific? Like, let's say a hundred thousand dollar property, should you cost save always, or? Uh, I would look at the, I would look at your tax implications and determine if you need to do a cost save. And if you don't need to do it, I wouldn't do it. Uh, so if you if, if you don't have the income 
that supports needing a cost segregation to get your taxes down. <coughs> Keep it. As far as the dollar price, uh, if you, you can do any you can do any cost segregation up until 500,000 with KBKG. You can go online, you can just put your own information in, it'll spit you out a uh, cost segregation study. Uh, cost three, four, yeah, 399, 400 bucks or something. Uh, so is it, are you gonna get more benefits than that $400 that it costs you to do it at your time? That would basically be, you know, the, the question that would be. Uh, another question that I would have is, if you do a cost segregation, I mean, not, not just a question, but a comment. Make sure your accountant is on board. Because you could do a cost segregation, save 3,000 on your taxes, and now the, ta now the accountant has filed 3115, he has to file some extra tax return, uh, extra forms, and he could charge you $3,000 more to do that tax return because of the extra forms he needs to file. And so, you know, did you really, well, at least you kept the, you know, at least you gave money to the accountant and not to the IRS. <laughs> but, you know, it wasn't really beneficial for you to do it. So, so if you don't need it this year, you can, you set up to 10 years Anytime. Do with that property. So yeah. if you want to, so if you need it in year eight, you could use that mm -hmm. same property and do cost state. Yeah. And then you could do anything that's five years. You could depreciate the rest of that immediately. You could do half of the 15 year on that first year. Uh, one of the things to keep in mind with cost segregation and what we were talking about tonight is there's something called depreciation recapture. And uh, so if you do, if you do cost segregation, uh, you could be subject to depreciation recapture when you sell that property, which means whatever you whatever you depreciate could, could come back and bite you. Uh, could be taxed to you as ordinary income in the year you sell the property. So you might want to go and put that property. Uh, that's where I would recommend doing the 1031 exchange, or if you're serious about it, just keep investing. Uh, if you're not serious about it, you might want to consider not doing a call save. You know, because of those reasons. Well, I think you just answered the question. Uh, the question was, if I did a cost seg and took 300000 in depreciation year one, and then year three you decided to sell, what, what are my implications? Yeah, for it's, it, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be added back. Uh, it'll be added back at a higher tax. It'll be added back in tax at a higher tax rate. Unless I do 1031 exchange. Unless you do a 1031 exchange, or you could also buy another property, well, uh, yeah, I was talking about 2022. You could have bought another property, did a, a sorry depreciation on that, took the losses off, of, you know, and offset the other property. Yeah, but, but now that the depreciation's gone down, might be something you have to watch and do more 1031 exchanges than what we saw in the last three, four years because of that. Right, uh, just a note on that, Everyone understands that the depreciate you'll get more depreciation. You just take it sooner. Yes. So yes. People think you're saving a ton, which you are obviously. If you're right. You're 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 taking depreciation on money now rather than over the next five years or over the next fifteen years. And if you look at the time value of money, how much is a dollar going to be worth in fifteen years from now? So you're actually got depreciating a higher uh, dollar than than what it will probably be in fifteen years from now. Uh, question on 1099s. So, does my housekeeper need to get a 1099? Does my furnace repair guy get 1099? Does the guy who replaces a window? Um, uh, are you talking business or personal? Business. Uh, dollar amount. 600 bucks. So, if I have a business and anybody comes in and does a furnace repair for 650, he needs to get 1099. Uh, $600 of labor. $600 of labor. So, it's, it's total of over $600, but it's uh, parts and materials, and the labor just comes up to 300 No. Okay. If the, if the dollar amount comes up to 600 yes, and then you take the full, just give them a 1099 for the full amount. Uh, the thing about 1099s is if you're recording your income correctly, a 1099 shouldn't phase you. All you're doing, all they're do, all you need to do is make sure your income is higher than the total 1099 that you got. If your income is lower than, if you record a lower income, then the total of your 1099s, then you're in trouble. And then one of the questions on 1099s: If I have a contractor who works for me exclusively, but over three or four different businesses, mm -hmm. does that make him a legal contractor rather than an employee? because he's working for different LLCs. 
I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> is, is he, uh, is, is he, uh, does he have his own insurance? Yes. Uh, does he have, uh, do you have an agreement in place? A contractor agreement? Not completely yet. We're working on it, but yeah, we don't yet. Oh, I'd like, I'd like to be your, I'd like to audit you. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. And he has a legit business name and, and all that. Yeah. Uh, but well, my question is because it's like if he not, was working for me exclusively, that wouldn't be okay. But right? because but the four businesses are related businesses, that's what problem comes in. Because it's because you own all four of the businesses, so it's still a problem. Yeah. Now, if there, there would be different percentage of ownership with those different businesses, then there would be a different argument. Like my wife selling me some. Wow. <laughs> you know, related parties. We were right back to that related party. So. Okay, that was a question. Yeah. Thank you. So, 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 yeah, it's, and, 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 that's, and that's where, make sure, you, make sure he's giving you an invoice. Make sure he's, uh, that you have a contract agreement and that he has insurance. And we can argue that anything. And, and he's using his own tools. You know, don't, don't give information they don't need. So, awesome. Yeah. Okay, one more question from John, and we're going to wrap it up. Well, this is just piggybacking on that because I think a lot of us dance the 1099 W2 dance. Um, but as far as you said, regular bill, is there anything that needs to be specifically included on that regular bill? Is, you know, for example, one of our guys sends a, an Excel sheet that basically is an hours tracker um, twice a month. Is that enough or should we be working on something more official? Does the IRS have anything that they outline that is needed? Uh, what does it like? What's the header? What's the header look like? Not much, header. Yeah, like, not much of a header. Not much of a header. It's not. It's not like. It's not like. Uh, what does it want? Like your business name, and then and then uh, employee pay or or employee. Like make sure it doesn't say employee. Right, and and no. certainly it doesn't. But yeah. would you encourage doing a, a header and an address like? Is that it, stuff it, that the IRS it, is going to want? Can, yeah, I mean, the documents are almost more important than you know what's actually on, just as long as it doesn't look like it's from an employee. Gotcha. So, okay. headers would be good, you know, anything that you can sort of defer from that, okay. uh, being an employee. So. And uh, follow up on that, you had said liability insurance. Um, a lot of the guys we use, well, I mean, storage, so it's low risk, um, you know, kind of low level labor. Um, wouldn't have a reason to otherwise carry liability insurance, uh, but definitely functioning as I would see as an independent contractor mm -hmm. for us. Um, is how firm of a requirement is it? I guess is question number one. And question number two: Do you ever have guys that kind of bill that out as part of their billing? So, in other words, could we pay? Yeah. For their liability insurance, if that's part of our contract or agreement, for like workers' comp and stuff, uh, or, or just as far as their liability insurance, um, you know, if we would dictate in the the contract or agreement that the the owner is reimbursed, I, I don't know. I, yeah, I'm, it gets it gets a little it gets a little gray there because you cannot insure something that's not yours. So if you're insuring him now, he's your employee. Okay. You know, so. So, so that's why we like to keep that separate and say, you get your own insurance, we'll pay you more to get your own insurance. But now you're intertwining and you're, you're doing this, you're, you're, you're basically saying, you're my employee, I'm covering you. You know, so that's, that would be my, that would, yeah. Okay, thank so, you. Thanks, thanks for the question. All right, how about a big hand for John Lapp?